Hi, I'm Tom Pragnola for Rock Roots and Blues Live with uh, Scott Sherrard. Hi, Scott. Thank you. How's it going, man? Uh, we're here at Gibson uh, Showroom and Studios, so I um, thought I'd ask you, what, what model Gibson do you play? My main guitar for well over a decade has been a custom shop 336, and I get questions about it all the time, um, mainly because... Gibson made something called the 339, also shortly after, that was a cheaper version of the guitar. It was ES-339. Then they stopped making all of them. <laughs> and then they started making 339s again, but the 339s were custom shop build quality. So it gets a little confusing. Mine's a, a CS-336 from 2001. Which they don't make anymore. And even to make it even more confusing, just recently they started making them again. And the more popular model is the 335? Is that? Well, the 335 is the classic model. Oh. That's, that's the original semi hollow Gibson guitar. Um, and it's what the 336 is patterned off of. I mean, the 336, I played a 335 for many years, but mine weighed like 12 pounds. It weighed like more than a Les Paul. And it was huge. They're, well, not huge, but it's bigger than a 336. <laughs> and when I played the 336, Sonically, it landed somewhere between a Telecaster and a 335, which is exactly what I was looking for. It has a brighter sounding top on it for some reason. I guess it's the tone wood or how they carve the tone chamber. But it's got, for me, the neck and the ring of the guitar is just perfect. So I, I haven't really, I mean, that is my go-to. I play it, you know, I can play whole shows with everybody on that guitar and it works for everything. It's one, it's like a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> But I've got other Gibsons that I love. I have my old 335, which um, um, my friend, uh, old student of mine, but now uh, now really coming up as a guitar prodigy, Connor Kennedy, he has my 335 that I grew up playing, so now he, he plays that. That's on permanent loan, I guess you could say. And then I have a Firebird, which uh, Gibson was, was nice enough to hook me up with, which I love. I use that for slide, mostly in the studio, because those guitars don't travel well. It's got a weird headstock and... You, you know, you have to get like a giant case for it if you want to really take it out. Um, so I've been procrastinating on that. But um, those are my, those are probably my main Gibsons. But the 336, man, that's my, the Custom Shop 336 is my thing. And I put, I have a few, like, appointments in it. I have a, a master volume. I have a great guitar tech named Paul Schwartz who has a shop called Peek and Moose Guitars here in Midtown in New York. And he had the brilliant idea, I wanted a master volume, and I, I didn't want the pick guard, so he had the brilliant idea of sticking the master volume right in the top of the F-hole, so we didn't have to drill a hole in the body or anything. Mm -hmm. And then he replaced all the wiring with high-grade speaker cable, and put locking tuners on it, took the frets out, put nice frets in, so... So yours is really custom model. Yeah, it's got its own <clears throat> nut, it's got its own saddle, it's like everything, everything's been upgraded about, you know, the mechanical parts of it have all been upgraded. And you only have one of those? Or I have two. have two. And they're identical. They both have the same mods, the same frets, the same wiring, the same. I have two that are... Although the neck on the other one, it's, it's a Sunburst, uh, the other one. My main guitar is called Tangerine Burst, which I don't even know if they make it anymore. It but... kind of looks striped almost, right? Well, it's got that wood. It's got grain wood in it. Um, I haven't seen any like it since I bought it. I mean, mm -hmm. I know they made quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. but, um, and then the other one I have is, I can't remember if it's Sunburst or Tobacco Burst, but that basically lives in the trailer with Craig Allman, um, just because I haven't had to use it yet, so right. <laughs> it just sits, in, sits on the side of the stage most right. of the time. That uh, takes me right into what I was going to talk about next. You're the guitarist in the Greg Allman band, uh, and you just got off the road, a uh, yep. little uh, break in the summer tour with Greg. That's right. Uh, so. You've been playing with Greg for about five years now? It's almost, well, it'll be six years in uh, November of uh, 2014. So, yeah, about five years. Um, and uh, I've been, uh, uh, recently I also uh, started, uh, I took up the role as music director of the band, too, a few months ago. So I've been doing that for him now. We've also been writing a lot of songs together. So it's been a good, um, it's been a really good ride because I started out sort of, as a side man, playing the music, learning the music, and, uh, you know, I grew up seeing the Allman Brothers as a kid, so, you know, they were, 
like many guitar players, one of my main inspirations. And Greg's singing and songwriting has always been a main inspiration for me as well. So joining his band and getting to work with him was amazing to start with. And now, you know, we've, we've continued to evolve our relationship. And now it's at the point where I'm helping him with material. And so uh, he's been performing some of your songs on the tour? He does one of my songs every night. Um, he's been doing it for almost, I guess, about six months or a year. It's called Love Like Kerosene. He does that song every night. All right. Um, it's usually our second to last tune on the show, or last tune, depending. And it's been going over really well with his audience. It's a really up-tempo, kind of barn burner type of yeah, blues yeah, yeah. song, you know. So it's pe people, see, especially at festivals, people seem to really get into it and dance and stuff. But yeah, I've been lucky enough to have him do that. And he's been. Um, he usually takes a break on the gig for one song, and he's been allowing me to sing uh, another one of my songs, "Endless Road." Okay. Gigs also, so that's been very generous of him. So, how's the uh, you know the songwriting with Drake been been going? Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, we've got um, we got a couple things. We got two songs that are damn close to finished. Um, one of them, I'm actually pulling out on my gig coming up this weekend with my band just to just to try it right. a little bit more. Right. We've run it with Greg's band, but we haven't gotten it quite tweaked to the point where he wants to start performing it. But And then we've got a, a really nice ballad tune that's also, I think, pretty much finished. But we've been, we got kind of sidetracked because I started writing with him really in earnest back in uh, February. We had a great weekend writing session at his house, and then I came and saw him at his hotel when he was doing the Beacon Run in New York City. And we finished those two songs, and then he got bronchitis, and then he broke his arm, and so mm -hmm. we've, we've, you know, really all our extra time to learn and develop the stuff is kind of temporary on hold. But hopefully we'll get back to that after this summer. Do, do, do you guys rehearse much before the tours or during the tours? Not as much as we'd like to, because uh, Greg is really busy, you know, especially between the Allman Brothers and, and all the other projects he gets tied up in. Um, Obviously, he's very in demand, you know, mm -hmm. on many levels with the book and uh, right. the movie and the, you know everything else that's going on. So, uh, the last tour we had a couple days to rehearse, you know, and uh, and it was it, it's the band right now is is just awesome. Well, yeah, I I know there's a DVD that was uh, recorded and will be released soon of a recent show at uh, the Grand Opera House in Macon. That's right, and. Uh, in a recent interview, Greg said, talking about the DVD, he said, uh, that band is a smoking motherfucker, absolutely smoking. <laughs> so I guess uh, he's feeling pretty good about it. That's great. Yeah. Um, so when you're not on tour with the Greg Allman band, you continue performing with your own band, Scott Sherrard and the Brickyard Band. Um, when I first became aware of you through uh, your playing in the Greg Allman band, I went out to, s to see you in the Brickyard Band here in New York City. And, and then subsequently, I, that was about the time I think you were about to release the CD, and I subsequently uh, got, you know, bought the CD at your CD release party. Um, but then I started working my way backwards through your three uh, solo uh, CDs, and then your music with the Chesterfields. Uh, so let's, let's start at the beginning. Uh, your, your very first CD, I believe, was Henry Street Soul with the Chesterfields. Well, there was another sort of, there was another release, but you can't. I don't even know if I have a copy of it. Anymore. <laughs> so the first official release, it, de it definitely had a, it had a barcode, so I guess it was official. Right. Uh, it was just called the Chesterfields, and that's when we were a trio, uh, you know, kind of like a power trio doing bluesier stuff. I think I was about 18 when we did that record. The Chesterfields Henry Street Soul was. I'd say like a wider release for us. It was still an independent, but uh, and it was a larger band. I mean, on the recording, there's as much as 12 or 14 pieces on some songs. Yeah, that CD seemed to be quite a strong statement coming out. Uh, it had a lot elaborate arrangements and production. Um, yeah, we really went. Encompasses for it. many different styles uh, and influences, um, primarily soul and R&B. I, I Definitely. I mean, that, that band, you know, that band, really the core of the band was myself and Sean Dixon, um, who's a multi-instrumentalist. He's primarily a drummer, but he also plays great bass, and he plays piano, and he arranges for strings and horns, and um, 
he and I were, you know, it was, it was one of those one of those partnerships where we would use a pool of sidemen that we love to work with, and that would make up the, deba the band. And depending on what the gig was, we would go from an organ trio to a five piece. But the main touring band was like a nine piece band. Really? Yeah. We didn't do that much. I mean, we got out of New York a few times. Um, we used to play at the Bitter End regularly on the weekends. We had a really nice run there. And uh, it was just one of those things where we just couldn't sustain it. You know, all those horn players and backup singers. Mm -hmm. But I'm super proud of that record. I mean, you know, it was definitely a collaboration between Sean and I. And um, you can hear, uh, you know, as much of, you know, his input and talent on that as you can mine if you if you really listen to it, you know. Um, and um, I don't know, I was pretty relatively young when we did that. I mean, I was like 21, 22 when we did that. So there are some things I would do differently now, but I like to say I don't have any, you know, I don't really have any regrets about any of the records I've ever done because I know I gave the best I could at that time for what I could do. Well, you know, I think they hold up pretty well. Uh, that's what I hope, you know, it's, I, I mean, the main thing is that they're there. I mean, you know, I hope people know about them one day, but they're, yeah. they're all there, you know. Oh, yeah. So, and you obviously have a, a deep affection for the old soul and R&B records. Um, even your first solo CD, Dawnbreaker, uh, looked like an old 45 record. That's right, yeah, um, the CD itself. So yeah. it seems like you're on a mission to uh, carry on the tradition. Um, tell me about your obsession with uh, Johnny Guitar Watson. It's not healthy at this point. <laughs> um, well, you know, the thing about Watson's music is that I was really into him when I was a teenager, and this goes back to me growing up in Milwaukee I, and, uh, and spending all my time in the blues clubs and playing in blues bands with guys who were 20, 30, 40 years older than me. And he was one of the guys that all the real dudes were really obsessed with. You know, there was a handful of guys who, and this is in the 90s, this is when I was a teenager, so, you know, there was Magic Sam, um, like all the Chicago guys were the Chicago people, so Magic Sam, Robert Nighthawk, Earl Hooker, they were kind of the deeper guys, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I automatically got into them and that sort of scene, and then from there, um, I got farther down the rabbit hole of the Texas and, and Louisiana thing, which is like, you know, um, uh, Guitar Slim and Johnny Guitar Watson. So I was really into the sort of early 60s Johnny Guitar Watson, you know. Okay. Which is like three hours past midnight, his version of Lonely Lonely Nights. Um, and what's funny is that in the 90s, you could not access so many records. Okay, so I would spend all my days trying to find vinyls of Grant Green Alive, The Meter's Rejuvenation, um, the list goes on Donnie Hathaway Live. And I found all these vinyls, but I could never find the vinyls of Johnny Guitar Watson. And for some reason, the older guys I knew, they had like some compilation tapes and I'd get a song here or there that was the 70s stuff. And I'd be like, man, this is amazing. Where can I find the rest? I remember um, the, uh, what was that song? Uh, there was this one tune, uh, Lonely Man's Prayer, I had, uh, which is from that period. And then, uh, a few years ago, I started finding all these songs on YouTube and then I realized that some of them had been reissued. So I kind of had this new obsession with him. And I mm -hmm. sort of rediscovered him song by song, you know. And, uh, you know, I started bringing him to the band. And, and, and I started playing them on gigs. And it's amazing that music when you play his music. Like, you know, Loving You, Real Mother For You, I Get a Feeling. You know, when you play Lonely Man's Prayer, when you play these songs, people just go crazy. At least in the club gigs I do, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost mm -hmm. the songs that make them go most nuts, and I think a lot of it's been sampled. So I think that's why a lot of a lot of people in their twenties or thirties get it. Uh -huh. A lot of the stuff has been sampled pretty heavily. They kind of recognize some of the grooves and beats. But um, the guy was a genius, you know, and his music is really the coolest thing about it to me is how it strikes this balance, and I I feel like where music's at right now is it's too serious or it's too stupid. And I feel like his music falls right in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Sly Stone was like that. I feel like Miles even had an element of that. Uh -huh. I feel like Hendrix had an element of that. Uh, 
Stax Records and Motown, Muscle Shoals. I mean, they all have that thing, you know? Right. And uh, I just, I, I like the concept of just... You know, the blues doesn't all have to be sad. I mean, some of it is, but but it's supposed to really be uplifting. I mean, really, it's it's melancholy yeah. music, if nothing else. I mean, it's not. It's it depends on who you're listening to, too. But right. Johnny, you know, he's a great example of somebody who's like he can celebrate the blues and he can also play soul, and it all mixes perfectly. And his guitar style is just unbelievable. He's right there with the Three Kings and. All those guys who have that beautiful economy and can just play one note, you know who it is, mm -hmm. you know? Great. Well, hopefully more people will uh, pick up on him. I, th years I think he's been getting some love. I mean, I, I know Doyle Bramall uh, the second's a big champion of his. I've uh -huh. seen Doyle talking about him in interviews right. a lot. Which, And I'm a huge fan of Doyle's music and his playing. So I think, you know, I think a lot of guys are aware. I think tons of guitar players are. I was just talking to Oz Noy about him the other day. Oh, yeah. You know, Oz came to one of my gigs and we were talking about it. He was like, "Man, I, you know, I forgot about Johnny Watson. It's so great. Like, I got to go buy all that stuff." That's cool. So, following uh, Dawnbreaker, you recorded uh, Monologue Analog. An other way around. Analog Monologue. Uh, it's a weird album title. Uh, did it have any particular meaning for you that title? Why did we call it that? I, I did all my a statement I, against. I, I should uh, say this now. Yeah. I guess it was. I should say this now because this probably pertains to him. But I've, I've co-produced all my records with uh, uh, my engineer friend Charlie Martinez, and he's a phenomenally talented guy, man. I mean, he's got, he's got an amazing resume. But it's really about we on Henry Street Soul. He mixed that album. That was when I was about twenty-one or so. So we've, you know, we've been ever since we worked on that record. We've been great friends and collaborators and uh, I suppose with that record Analog Monologue I mean we were that record I was having a lot of trouble coming up with a title when we were going back and forth and I know I came up with the title I ran it past him and basically the idea was you know yeah it's like going back to going back to the roots of analog like the warmth and the soul of analog and I guess the monologue part is supposed to be about uh, the you know something that has to do with the lyrics Right. It's a very vague idea. It seemed to make a lot of sense at the time. But I, it's, I like the title. It's all uh, right. And then you followed that up with uh, Anti Up, which was the name of the studio where you recorded it? That's right. Anti Up is a studio. At, actually, I think they changed the name now, and I, they definitely moved the studio in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, my friend Charlie got uh, some, uh, some free studio time to use there. All right. So, uh, we got in my car and drove out with Diego Vogolino, Jeff Hanley, and Charlie Martinez and I, two cars. We drove out to Cleveland and we made the record and basically we made the record in about four hours. Really? Yeah. I mean, we had a first day of setting up where we weren't really getting takes and we were a little frustrated and we just said, screw it, let's just do it tomorrow. The next day we went and hit it and did all the songs and then drove back. Well, it's so a lot of strong songs, and it sounds like it took a lot longer than four hours, that's for sure. Thanks, man. Uh, we had a lot of fun making it. I mean, it was kind of like a big party, though. We spent most of the weekend figuring out what restaurants to go to. <laughs> so, so something like that, is it recorded basically live with the, you know, the three uh, musicians at the same time, or do you, you know, go through the more elaborate recording? Well, I mean, that's kind of... The recording method, for me, is cut up into two phases. Because Dawnbreaker and Analog Monologue, my first two, I'm playing most of the instruments on those records. Okay. Um, Dawnbreaker, we have Charlie Drayton on a couple drums. On, a, on drums on a couple songs, I should say. On more than a couple drums. <laughs> and he, he also did some Chesterfield stuff. He did. There was, after a, there was an EP song. we did. Yeah, the yeah. Chesterfields EP, he did that. Um, and he's, you know... He's my favorite drummer of all time, pretty much. It's just, you know, he's hard to get a hold of because everybody agrees with me. <laughs> okay. But he's yeah. like, uh, to me, he's the best drummer ever. And if you haven't checked him out for any reason, you, right. you've got to get on it. Because that guy's feel and musicality is just, it's second to none. So I hope I get to work with him again one day. It's one of my, one of my, 
deepest hopes. All right. But uh, we had a great time working together, and we managed to hook up for that period of time. So we did the Chesterfield EP. Charlie Drayton played all the drums on that. And then uh, on my solo record, we actually used a couple leftover songs from that session. So, but I played most of the instruments on right. uh, that record. I played drums on six songs on Dawnbreaker. Then on Analog Monologue, Sean Pelton played drums on the whole thing. He's also obviously a phenomenal drummer. Um, and he did an amazing job on that record. Um, and then I played pretty much everything else. We have musicians here and there. Charlie Martin is, is a great bass player. He played bass on some of those. Uh, my friend Brian Charette played a lot of great organ stuff on those. Jay Collins came in and did horns on Analog Monologue. Um, so, you know, we did have some outside, but I was playing like bass, guitar, keyboards, um, and then drums on Dawnbreaker. For Anti Up and Brickyard Band Records, we did everything live on the floor. Bass, drums, guitar, lead vocals. Uh, Brickyard, we added Moses Petru and Ben Stivers. So that's second drum kit in organ and electric piano. Okay. So both of those records were done completely live, and then we would, anything else you hear that we added later, there were probably a couple vocal fixes I did, maybe. Um, maybe a song or two where I re-sang the vocals, but those records are pretty much live, except for the horns. So. All right. So the Brickyard Band has two drummers, uh, Diego and Moses. Um, is that a premeditated decision on how you want the instrumentation, or how, how did that come about? I couldn't pick one. Okay. I just couldn't do it. Not for that record. And I was hearing the two-drum thing. I mean, I know it's come back in fashion with Tedeschi Trucks and... Uh, that those guys are amazing in that band, um, right. and uh, Tyler and uh, and JJ. But um, you know, I I just genuinely love playing with these two guys. Okay. And uh, Moses is such a great singer and songwriter. I wanted to bring him into the fold as well to have his contribution. That's what kind of made it the Brickyard Band. In fact, the name the Brickyard Band that was even his idea. I was uh, trying to come up with a name for it. He was what? What about? Which what comes from an Alan Toussaint song? Yeah, from Brickyard Blues. All right. It describes the sound of that band really well. I mean, lately, I've kind of it just got to the point where it was just a pain in the ass for us to deal with two drum kits. And we also had Moses playing keyboards on some of the gig, and it just became too much of a hassle to set it up and get everyone's schedules right. So mm -hmm. lately, I've been splitting it into two bands. So I have like an organ trio version, and then I have a four-piece version. And the organ trio is with Moses and Adam Scone or George Lax. And then the four-piece band is with Diego Vogelino, Jeff Hanley, and right now either Ben Stivers or Pete Levin. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so it's kind of sprung into two bands at this point. So in your recording, uh, how much suggestion or direction do you give the drummers? Well, I mean, as much as they'll take without me pissing them off, I guess. You know, it's... So you if, do have a, a, a real sound, a if you sound have or the feel right in, guy, your, in your mind. If you have the right guy on any instrument, you have to tell them very little. Okay. You know, you just have to know how to pick your men. I mean, that's one of the most important things. If you pick the right men, they'll, they'll know what to do instinctually. Um, and then when they don't, They'll have, they'll have the humility and the wisdom to listen and interpret it. Okay. And find the middle ground between what you hear and what they hear. And I've been extremely blessed in my life to work with a lot of musicians who possess that quality and who I can trust. And certainly those guys in my band are, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're all good friends of mine you know, as well as collaborators. So there's a certain sound we make when we play, and you just have to accept that. You can't, you know, turn someone into another player. Right. And you, you play a lot of different styles. Um, I mean, when, even when I'm still uh, listening to your CDs, I'm still surprised at how seamlessly uh, different songs, or even within a song, uh, the style changes. And um, it's it's kind of, it's, a, it's impressive. And, and for the listener, it's um, it's like a little you know like a little jiggle up you know you, it reengages you with if you were starting to space out you you immediately get reengaged with the song because something has changed and it's it's uh, very interesting. Um, 
So is it difficult keeping the band together and scheduling gigs uh, between the Greg Allman tours? Well, like I was saying, I've had to even split my band into two separate bands just because I can't consistently get those five guys together. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's a definite juggling act. I mean, Greg, looking at, you know, the Greg Allman band taking up most of Greg's time, so, and he definitely wants to make a record with his own band, so it's, it sucks down my bandwidth quite a bit uh, for my own thing. So last time, uh, I think that Greg CD, the project started out as basically sort of session guys playing. Uh, I think even Dr. John's on that CD. But so will he record with the uh, touring band? Well, it started out as the touring band doing the record, oh. and then T Bone Burnett and 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 the team, I guess the management and Greg, kind of decided that they wanted to go with t-bone sound which i mean you know you have to respect the man's process i mean you know right. I, I produce records too and, and and i can see you know someone like t-bone he has such an identifiable sound and thing and uh i think he wanted to make sure that he got his mark on it which I, you know of course you know you have to totally respect that i mean he's his own artist as well and i think it was kind of a it ended up being sort of a collaboration between him and greg so what do you think will happen on a, on a new CD recording? Well, Greg tells me that he won't do another record without his band. Good. So he, he swears that. I like to hear that. And uh, the band we have right now are a bunch of young, hungry, badass musicians who love Greg and his music. So he would be well served to utilize them because the level of dedication I've seen with this group of individuals and his band is is awesome, and I hope that I I hope more than anything that that the public gets to meet the Greg Allman band again, kind of like they did in the '80s. Because mm -hmm. in the '80s, the original Greg Allman band that really made waves in the '80s with the I'm No Angel album and the Bullets Fly record with the Toller Brothers, Dan and Frankie, mm -hmm. that band. They were in the videos, they were in the interviews, they were, you know, they were in the publicity photos. I mean, it was a real band. I mean, it was Greg's band, but it was a real right. band. And I, I would like to see more of that come into the picture because you wouldn't believe how many places we play. We play all over the world with this band. And I, I come off stage and I don't know how many times I, I have people come up to musicians, fans, and they're like, who's this band? Who are these guys? Are you, in his are you regularly in his band? Like, people don't even know we exist. Right. And I think that, um, I think it's time for that to stop. I think it's time, now that the Allman Brothers are retiring and Greg's going into his own thing, I think, I think it's time for, for Greg and, and his band to, to, to grab their piece of the pie. You know, just like, uh, you know, you see uh, the Government Mule doing, you know, a series of gigs at the Beacon and Tedeschi Trucks a series of gigs mm -hmm. at the Beacon mm -hmm. and doing great shows and having great turnouts. I think Greg should certainly expect the same kind of career and you see the same thing with their bands their bands you know you know the Jesse Trucks band you know, sure. you know who's right. in that band you know right. they're they they feature their band and, and I think that that makes them stronger and makes their music and their following a fan stronger as a result so I think I think that'd be a good thing for Greg to move into and I think he has the right group to do that uh, as far as what goes on behind the scenes right. that's that's not well, that's great to hear so. I hope I hope that uh, continues